then you, you were officially mar part of the club. You'd be like a priestess. So, I mean, it's an amazing hallowed place. So once I had that, originally it was going to be these three hyenas having sex, and then behind them you'd have this fresco of a little picture of Eros, a little, a little like an angel, like a cupid over them. So it would be a reference to sacred and profane love. Once the hyenas were in there, I realized that you really didn't need the sacred love, that it was fine being dirty, the dirty, raunchy painting that it is. Um, and so I left it that way. And so that actually begins the cycle of five paintings. And it continues through there, through a kind of a life cycle, through death, and even beyond that. Some of the paintings I'm dealing with now are dealing almost with uh, like imagery of like Roman tombs or Egyptian tombs, and this sort of the sense of the soul trapped in this locked room in the afterlife. So that's the latest work. And all of this can be seen actually on johnobrega.ca, john.nobrega.ca. It's hard um, to describe yeah. art, so you'd have to see it yourself. There's a series of studio shots up there right now which gives you a sense of the amount of space it takes to make those paintings, how they all kind of relate together, and um, and the details of kind of the surface uh, the surface qualities that I'm, I'm I'm trying to get in these paintings. So uh, the the paintings I think I'll, I'll, when the series is done, I'll have all of them documented properly and you can see them. Uh, but for right now, there's just a very interesting series of, of studio shots and details that'll uh, you know provide the the pictures that I can't I can't approximate with a thousand words. And how about other artists that have influenced you? We uh, discuss some uh, names that. Uh, you can introduce people that are not familiar with them. Um, hmm. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's a really. We tend to talk about Jeff Koons. I do. I talk about. I, I do talk about Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons certainly is very important. I've always admired what Jeff Koons did, particularly with the Made in Heaven series. Um, uh, what Damien Hirst has done with the, the, the For the Love of God, the Crystal Skull. I, I admire those artists because they deal with the timeless themes. They deal with themes of sex and death and love, but they deal with it in a modern way. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, Francis Bacon certainly was a very, very important painter to me. I remember him dying when I was around 16, and not even realizing how important I was then because I just discovered him. Uh, a lot of artists from the past. Um, um, and, and let's not forget music. Let's not forget rock and roll. Um, uh, Steve was a, you know, really instrumental in, in, into uh, introducing me to the writings of Arthur Rimbaud. This is very cross-referenced literature, music, art, for you, yeah. it's a whole big picture. Very much so, very much so. And sexuality as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, I mean, it's all, I mean, well, that's, you could argue that that's the engine powering everything else. So, um, so, uh, I, it was interesting, I remember you um, having uh, Ian Blurton on here talking about raw power. I've heard it said that rock and roll fans were either raw power fans or funhouse fans. I have to admit, I'm a funhouse fan. Uh, yeah, I'm a Funhouse fan just because I've always liked the, um, see I'm trying to steer it back into the, the rock and talk mold, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I've always been a Funhouse fan because the cliche is that the, the, the raw power people tend to be a little bit more punk, they tend to be more hard rock, and whereas those that like uh, Funhouse uh, maybe like more like noise bands, or because I know that Iggy said that he was listening to a lot of free jazz and a lot of Sun Ra and stuff like that. Oh, and but the saxophone well. absolutely, and so I've always I've always loved Funhouse just for the texture of it, just the the sound of it. I think we have talked about it once. You referred to it as sounding hollow, and it is amazing. You've got this the greatest band of all time playing at the bottom of a crater. So you so, do think it's the greatest band of all time? Uh, yeah, it's hard for that kind of music, for that sort of genre. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Um, it, so that certainly is very, very influential. Um, you know, music's always been music, music and literature and movies have always been, have always been all mixed up. And I've made a film too, which you, is also there on on John Slash and Brady. And which, in fact, was the first recording ever produced over here at uh, Pentagram. That's right. It was it was it was, it was recorded. It was recorded on, on an SG, um, the black SG, and then digitally altered. Um, to uh, create the kind of soundscape in there. And as I said, when you when you listen to that. A lot of my musical tastes are probably pretty obvious. I mean, I, I couldn't play a chord to save my life. But I, I like texture. I like texture in painting, and I'm very, very sensitive to the idea of, of, of sonic texture and to sort of layering. I've always thought that the way I work as a painter, building things up through layers and sanding them down and building them up again, was you know sort of the visual equivalent of, of overdubbing. And just trying to get that that right density, and you know it when you've got it. But until it's there. Um, uh, it, it's just something that's, that's, that's in your imagination. Well, John, I'd like to uh, personally make a statement that uh, music, sex, art, and literature are to me the holy quadrant. And uh, the only time I've ever shed tears is in an art gallery or a funeral. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for so uh, influencing and, and uh, bringing great art into my life. Let me ask you one final question. 
what would you tell young artists? What would you advise them? How would you, uh, uh, what would you say to young artists uh, going into this great uh, genre of expression, which you have dedicated your life to? Uh, I'd say, first of all, don't be afraid of, of making a fool of yourself in public. Get past any feelings of shame you might have. It's those, those things will inhibit you. They'll hold you back. Um, I've also, I would also say that it's, it's easy to be cool. You can fake being cool, but you can't fake being good. So don't worry about what's cool. Don't worry about what you're reading about in art magazines right now that's cool. It's not going to be cool in 10 years. Um, stick with, go, find your instincts, find your instincts, and find a couple of people who could be like what Stephen Leckie was for me, or what Margaret Gandhi, who I hope Betty Moon will be on the show, or Viva has been for me, people who can give you honest opinions. Not art teachers, not people, but people who know you well enough to know when you're, when you're going off course. When you, you're sort of bullshitting yourself a little bit or trying to do something that you think other people are going to like. Because the people that know you well enough will know when you're being funny. So I would, I would argue that. You know, so get yourself an audience, a really core group of people that you can, you can, you can uh, reflect off of. And, uh, and, and find, something, find something that you want to say enough that's going to, uh, that's going to sustain you through those long hours in the studio because you're not having a show every day. You're not having you know reviews in the paper every day. Most of the time, it's just you alone there in the studio. So find a statement, and uh, and find a way of working that's satisfying enough that it can sustain you through that because that's usually where people go off the rails. The solitude, the, you know, the, the necessary alienation that comes along with creativity um, leads a lot of people down uh, different paths that aren't necessarily the, the the most productive ones artistically. So. That's what I would say.